for language issues. Um, hi, welcome. Uh, nice to see you all here. Welcome to this uh, second Thursday event of the semester. Uh, my name is Björn Allemark and I run the public events program here at uh, KTH School of Architecture. Um, and uh, yeah, almost every Thursday we have something happening here in Triangle. Uh, a lecture, uh, a panel debate or something else, a film screening perhaps. Um, today we have a double lecture uh, by two new professors at the school, familiar faces but new roles. Uh, and Katja, uh, head of research, Katja Grillner, head of research at uh, the school, will introduce them uh, both. No? Okay. Thank you very much. It's uh, fantastic to have this opportunity here today uh, to introduce uh, Ulrika Karlsson and Jonas Rundberger. You have both been uh, uh, at this school uh, for a long time, and we have been uh, collaborating in different ways uh, for a long time uh, as well. Uh, but Ulrika Karlsson, you are here as a professor in uh, digital design, I think it translates to, digital design methods and tools since uh, last autumn. So it's almost a year quite soon that you've been here. Uh, and. Uh, and you also have, I'm starting to introduce Ulrike, and then I will introduce Jonas as well before Ulrike will start her talk. Um, and you have a double professorship right now, which is quite interesting, because at the same time as you were appointed here, you were also appointed at Konstfak uh, as interior architecture professor. So you have double roles and double subjects in some way, which is really interesting and which both universities, I should say, have been really supportive of this construction. So on behalf of KTH, we are very happy with this. And uh, Ulrike, uh, you are a founding member of Servo, which I actually don't know when you founded Servo, but it must be something like 1997 or 1999. Okay. So it's a 15-year anniversary uh, this year. Uh, and Jonas Rundberger, uh, you are now adjunct professor here at KTH since February 2014. And adjunct professor means that there is a professorship in industry uh, partnership, which is very, very valuable for KTH uh, to have uh, professorships where industry goes in and says, we want this excellent person to conduct research at KTH. And and uh, the industry partner that is uh, uh, supporting your professorship is White Architects, and you're also uh, working at White Architects as uh, head of the research uh, uh, laboratory, which is the, yeah, research laboratory, uh, which you started up and founded. Uh, and you did your PhD and finished your PhD here in 2012, and. Uh, I also supervised uh, as co-supervisor and main supervisor for one part, the PhD research work. Uh, and what was interesting, I think, is that with industry work, uh, professional practice, uh, as head of uh, the R&D work at Scheibel Svensson Architects Office, and then you moved to uh, White Architects in 2000. 10, maybe? Yeah. Uh, and I, just as a starting point before I let Ulrika in, I, oh, sorry. I wanted to point to the kind of history of this field. I brought some heavy books that I think are some cool books. Um, maybe I start with Jonas Rundberg's PhD from 2012, which is the most recent in this pile. Uh, and uh, here I have a very nice and uh, purple book which presents uh, features work of Servo, Latent Utopias from 2003, I think, so it's more than 10 years old. Uh, and about at the same time, there was a really interesting exhibition in uh, Centre Pompidou in Paris, Architecture Non Standard, which also featured 
uh, service work. And I also brought our own pub publication, uh, ARCAD from 2005, which features the work then from uh, the collaboration between Jonas, Ulrika, and others here at the school. Uh, Daniel Norell and Pablo Miranda are still at the school through the research group Kretz. Um, so, very, very welcome. We'll start with Ulrika, and then Jonas will speak, and then we'll have a little bit of a conversation after that. Okay, thank you. One, two, three, you hear me? You hear me? Uh, anyway, uh, you have to excuse me if I have to all of a sudden uh, pull out my glasses. I only have this sheet of papers with some texts on, and uh, I don't know if I can read this, <laughs> but we'll try. Uh, I'm very, very happy to be here. Thank you for setting this up. Uh, and uh, I also, I see my students here. I see many people that I have collaborated with. I might not mention all the names, but uh, it's very, very fantastic to be here talking today. Also in relation to KTH and the School of Architecture, which has made some of these projects possible. I have a most, uh, there are three things that I want to bring up. Uh, the notion of aesthetics and the store of Le Cheval Académique. I want to talk about precise inexactitudes. And I want to talk about translations, the re relationship between uh, representation and fabrication. These are the three subject matters I would try to cover. Um, also, just a little bit of a background. I will show projects from here, from Konstfak, but also from uh, Bartlett School of Architecture, where also during the last academic year, uh, have been teaching uh, uh, urban design students, actually. So you will see like a little bit of a broad, broad background. Anyway, aesthetics is an ambiguous concept or an oxymoron uh, having simultaneous irreconcilable positions, an inclination to disturb or obstruct identity and system, yet operating from within the system it's attempting to challenge. How can something that muddles, uh, is messy, generate something that is understood as precise? How can architecture addressing aesthetics put forward something highly articulated and refined? Le Cheval Académique is a text written by uh, Georges Bataille, uh, 1929, for the French magazine Document. Georges Bataille was a writer and a philosopher. Uh, uh, and what he was trying to, he was talking about the notion of the hippopotamus and the hippo. And the hippo is an abbreviation of hippopotamus. And in Greek, hippos translates to horse. But actually, the hippopotamus, the hippo in English, is the... I have to <laughs> so if, if the hippos, the, uh, the hippo in Greek translates to horse, the hippo or the hippopotamus in English translates to this animal. Um, Georges Pataille provides a thought-provoking contrast between the two creatures. The horse is portrayed as the noble animal of Greek antiquity and used as an expression of the pure idea, an emblem of the eidos of Platonic philosophy or the architecture of Acropolis, an academic animal. So this is from uh, British Museum. It's on the one of the gables of the Acropolis or Pantheon. Pantheon. Um, so it's a horse actually on the Acropolis. The hippopotamus, on the other hand, is re related to the barbarian, or, uh, or um, uh, Bataille relates that to the barbarian culture of the French Gauls. Um, he, th he kind of uh, think that relates more to, to the, the, the French Gauls' monstrous uh, inclinations and behaviors. Um, it has been related to the sweating monster in danger of melting, something that uh, Yves Lambois talks about in the book Formless. Melting or fusion is an entropic physical process and occurs during a phase transition of a substance from solid to liquid. This potential threat of falling into indifference has further informed the projects under consideration as they have engaged with a combination of digital and analog techniques of design and fabrication. The architectural design research presented here is messing with the generative ambiguities and incongruities found during the translation from digital information to material processes, from material processes to digital information, 
the mathematical process of control interfaces with analog processes of fabrication. Geometry, one can say, has been architecture's academic course. And, um, or, as Greg Lynn puts it, the preferred language of architectural communication. Um, Greg Lynn, in a text 20 years ago, 1993, uh, an architect and an uh, important educator in the field of digital design and methodologies, um, wrote an ar article called Probable Geometries, where he lays out the notion of exact and inexact and inexact geometries. Whereas the exact relates to something that can be described, is precise, it's the sphere. It's both is the, the kind of precise as an idea. We know all what a sphere is and how a sphere is defined. And it, ca it can be completely reduced to its idea. The inexact are figures that can't be described. Their contours can't be described. They are vague, he talks about. But he puts up another concept, which is inexact and inexact yet rigorous things that can be described locally precise, but can't be wholly reduced. Uh, irreducible but precise geometries. And these are some diagrams from his uh, project uh, Embryological House, where he actually sets up uh, a diagram of different instance of the possibility of different instantiations of a house, depending on how you manipulate a series of uh, vertices. Uh, uh, starting from uh, uh, um, starting from the upper left corner and going down. Uh, the work and argument I'm presenting here seeks to revisit the notion of the inexact avoided by Greglin, proposing a precise inexactitude, as my colleague Marceline Gao, who is also part of Sovo, who is uh, situated in Los Angeles, she, she likes to no uh, talk about the notion of the precise inexactitude. Um, to kind of give a few examples of this, uh, like the two ways of thinking about inexact, inexact forms and inexact processes. And inexact forms is something that can appear as they are not reproducible, things that appear as they are not reproducible, and inexact processes are processes that are in fact non-reproducible. In Linda Bengeli's work, it's, um, one can say it's an um, inexact process. It's the process is inexact. It's a uh, it's not reproducible because it's a pouring liquid by hand. The Roxepain project, Schumax, one can almost call, say it's a kind of an inexact form, but yet an exact process that is reproducible. It's a machinic deposition of a, of a, of a uh, uh, not a liquid, but a viscous matter, some kind, paint in this in this instance. Another, uh, now I'm going to show film. Okay, I can't show the film. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to put on the film. Anyway, another product by Eilis Labour, who was a student in the Studio 5 here, the master stu studio that I'm teaching here at KDA School of Architecture. She last year did um, a design for an equestrian center and the dome structure. And uh, where she actually um, um, thank you. she gave uh, computer numerical controlled instructions to a machine that deposited uh, a redundancy of looping wires. So here I can say that the process is, is pr reproducible but the form is not because of the redundancy in the looping and the mistakes occurring when depositing the thread. Another project from last year is by Simon Estier, um, also working with the Equestrian Center and uh, here we see his stable. Here he uses uh, on-site fabrication technique where he is envisioning that you cast the roof structure of the stable on the ground and then you excavate the ground uh, after it has a uh, uh, process or, or hardened. Um, this one can say is a non-reproducible process, therefore inexact process, inexact. But if 
he would have used, for example, if I propose that you would actually um, use a computer numerically controlled tractor or robot to form the sand or form the ground, you could actually say that uh, <laughs> it's an inexact form, wi which means that you can actually reproduce the process in which it has been made. This is an uh, art project by Gunilla Klingberg, a Swedish artist, uh, in uh, northern Spain, uh, where she has a steamroller press a pattern on the shore uh, through weather and wind and time. The pattern gets uh, obscured, blurred, and uh, repositioned. And she has this machine. <coughs> She has this machine iteratively, iteratively coming back to the shore to re uh, to re um, redraft the pattern. One can say. Another project by Annabel Jivein Yun Chao in London at Bartlett. They are working with a, a notion of distributed manufacturing we're thinking of using on-site clay, uh, different mixes and, um, uh, and uh, remixes of clay and extruding clay through a mesh to, uh, uh, to generate a manufacturing technique, an on-site manufacturing technique. They're, they are kind of speculating on this. And here they use a mesh that is uh, laser cut uh, to uh, press the extrusions through and have developed a series of techniques to, to control the extrusions, yet depending on the wetness of the clay and the performance of uh, uh, the, the context, it will behave in different ways. They have also worked with simulations, uh, digital simulations, where they have been able to uh, look into different parameters such as uh, fluid dynamics, velocity, etc., to look at the the, the the performance or the, the the potential effect if it would go through, um, if it would be affected by the weather and the wind and the water conditions that are um, extreme in this context. So the analog and the digital mixing of both design and fabrication processes allows for the production of artifacts, even buildings, that incorporate aspects of inexact and inexact geometries, processes, and forms. Inherent in architecture practice are shifts from one medium into another, from drawing to model or from drawing to building, which involves varying degrees of specificity. The exclusion of certain kinds of information and the inclusion of other kinds of information within a given medium is driven by the conventions of architectural notation, where a degree of generalization is often required in the interest of enhancing legibility. This is a project uh, by a couple of students at Konstfak. Uh, they are looking into the relationship between drawing and manufacturing. Uh, I will end by talking about one of the projects of Servo, pretty recent projects that many of you have been involved in. It's called Vector Interference. It's a a KTH uh, multi-purpose building. It's a building for um, uh, exhibiting the research and education here at KTH. We don't know if it will go through or not, but uh, anyway. Simple vector techniques were used for both the design in terms of massing and subdivision to provide for architectural specificities and for logics of machinic processes for fabrication. In the work, a non-dimensional vector field, as you can see, these are curves, like non-dimensional curves, produce vector interference when gaining negative thickness through CNC machining subtractive process of fabrication. So here we didn't uh, feed the CNC with a geometry, but we fed it with a series of non-dimensional curves. Uh, but the treatment of the surface of the wood achieved a, a surface geometry. But it was nothing that uh, was uh, like the, the, the input from the architect the initial input from the Arctic was a series of vectors. The drawing, the representation, was coming after the fabrication. So the drawing you see here on the, on the right-hand side. Later, when translating this exact mathematical code, 
of the resulting excavated block of wood and its surface geometry into an architectural vector drawing, the drawing seemed to consist of a series of interrupted or corrupted lines, gaining textural qualities and sensibilities related to the domain of comics. In this case, the representation stood as a result of fabrication. The project aimed at embracing these corruptions and entropic instances that had an eroding effect on the figure of architecture. At full scale, the resulting cavities and issues of the vector interference prov provide a rough surface for low maintenance biotic roofscape to adhere. A composite approach to material and environmental architectural systems oscillates between the precisely figured and an erosion of the discrete identity. So going back to this, we later translated also both a kind of a smaller scale um, um, excavations or erosions onto the larger scale uh, figure of the roof. Uh, these niches or these cavities started to obstruct or, or conflict with the structural geometry of the roof uh, by that somehow creating this ambiguous relationship between what is structural and what is figure and when, when a eroding process occurs. Another aspect that we was looking into was the notion of black. The culture consumption of black is a recurrent popular inclination. A journalist just admitted that as a teenager, the search for the darkest became the goal of any culture consumption until I heard the black metal band ba Dark Thrones ablaze in the northern sky and thought that nothing could be more shadow shrouded. But recently, to his surprise, he came across Vanta Black. And Vanta Black is made of small, small carbon <laughs> nanotubes that grow on aluminum. And they, the, uh, it's a material that is able to absorb almost all light, 99.965% of all light. What happens when light is totally absorbed, it obliterates any reading of figure or geometry. So the black has also like an uh, obliterating effect of figure, identity, and character. The only thing that is legible is, is the outline of the, of, the, of the figure. So, so what we commonly perceive as black in every day is usually a dirty, uneven black or a, a messy black. It's a brownish black or a bluish black or reddish black. There is no, no not a pure black or uneven black. But blackness has some kind of a, uh, on the product of vector interference, another layer of eroding the figure. In this project, we used charring as a process for blackening. It's, uh, we were burning the wood, charring the wood. And uh, it's a process where you uh, make a chemical process of incomplete combustion. Um, and uh, it removes all oxygen and hydrogen from the solid and leaves a residue of char which has a blackish, grayish quality. Th this procedure has uh, traditionally been used for um, conservation or for protecting from weathering, from fire, rot, and pests, etc. So it also has a kind of a, a part of the kind of architectural canon of, of uh, treating a surface. Um. So here are a series of drawings that also exemplifies how the different amounts of the of the niches that erodes the surface. And as I said before, the idea of these small niches is to actually uh, hold mosses, different colors of mosses. And over time, since mosses are spreading the spore spread, they will start to intermingle. If we, if we would start with have only red mosses there, only blue mosses there, but over time they will also start to blur and create this kind of uh, m uh, fuzzy uh, color mix of mosses in the cavities. I will end with just saying, it is relevant to ask whether the contemporary interest in eluding the instant legibility of formal logics is primarily a technological or a cultural phenomenon.
Okay, th thank you very much, Ulrike, for uh, also that last sentence, which I'm sure we can also unpack and discuss uh, uh, after Jonas lecture. Maybe I should also comment. Okay, I can I can do that. These drawings that we saw last, um, they're extremely uh, detailed and precise in the resolution that you can see on an on another computer screen and also in printouts that I think we have in office. So there is a fantastic resolution to those drawings. Okay, welcome, Jonas. Okay, thank you. Um, I think it's hard to to beat Ulrike's lecture. It's very a very beautiful one, and what, what I came to mind is that um, while you talk about aesthetics, um, I will do a very messy lecture, I think. Um, so I chose to call this notes on digital practice, and as Katja mentioned before, a long-term interest of mine has been to find relations between practice, research, education, and I also would like to add experimentation, um, and, and just to sort of put some kind of a boundary on, on this idea of digital design, which literally means nothing today, perhaps. Um, more or less everything is digital one way or another. Um, but in terms of practice, uh, we, we of course uh, face uh, an industry that's uh, transforming. We talk ab about BIM, new processes and so on. Uh, something which really deals with information and process management. Um, computational design, um, and I should say that th these definitions are really a way for me to, to identify certain aspects and many people would disagree on the differences and say that well many of them are the same. But to me computational design really relates to analysis, uh, simulation, optimization, systemization. And what I chose to call digital design uh, is really the integration of architecture and techniques, um, discussions on form, performance, design cultures and discourses uh, around that. That's kind of a background just to position where my interest lies, so uh, hence digital design practice. Um, I'll say a few words about my background, and Katja already mentioned this uh, uh, collaborative chat, which uh, Ulrika also was part of. Uh, it was founded by Ulrika and Marcelin uh, Gao, uh, myself, Daniel Norell, and Pablo Miranda, 2003-ish, uh, and also part of ACAD. Uh, and I bring that up because I see the, the series of projects we did uh, back then as experiments. And I'll get back to that. Um, my current mode of practice, as mentioned before as well, is um, uh, within White Architecture, where I'm heading a very small team, uh, or what I kind of would like to call a, a, um, an environment for development of digital design that we've coined uh, DSearch. Uh, it's part of a bigger initiative to transform all our processes, uh, but I'll, I'll also get back to this. Um, so that's my, my foot in practice at the moment. Um, I teach here together with Oliver Tessman uh, and currently also Karok Muatar uh, in Studio 9. Uh, I've been teaching here for a long time and elsewhere. So education is one part which I find really interesting to relate to, um, which I'll also return to. And finally, I've concluded uh, my PhD here uh, two years ago uh, about, and uh, well, that was research really conducted uh, through a mode of practice and design. Um, I, I still regard that as a special chapter here, uh, of course, relating to discourses and, and theory, uh, but also methods. So the reason I wanted to bring this up is that that then paints a picture of, of sort of four areas, uh, experiments, practice, education, and research. And um, um, I think I will move pretty fast now, because in order to paint that map, or think about that map, um, which maybe you could consider these are different environments. They, they face different conditions. Uh, we do different things. Uh, but I would like to, to sort of plunge down um, in them in different ways and hopefully somehow start to uh, paint a picture. I know this will probably be pretty illegible, but I've, I've tried to sketch out, uh, or, or let's say my notes is in the form of a map, that sets relations between these different uh, fields. This is really a map in the making uh, and, and quite vague in many ways. Uh, but I consider the, these arrows are really meant to say that, well, 
uh, education brings something to research. It brings something to, to practice uh, and to experimental approaches and so on. So this is kind of the mode I'll try to uh, go through. Um, and in the first case, then, I will look at practice and uh, hopefully uh, pinpoint a few things that I think uh, is important. I mean, in a way, how, how education, for instance, informs practice uh, the way we do it. And to me, then, practice, uh, as I said, is uh, within a much, uh, a very large firm, one of the biggest ones in Scandinavia, in a very small environment there. Um, and what we do is that we support the development of, of projects in different kinds. Uh, we sometimes take charge of them. Uh, but one important factor when you're in practice uh, is, of course, um, there's always collaboration, uh, and you always have to think about processes. Uh, this is an old uh, process diagram uh, back in the days when I was somehow involved in industrial development. Thoughts about how you could continuously develop something while you take what you learned so far and you use it in a project, and then you turn back and you have sort of a back-end development. And this is a similar chart that is a very rough outline of how we see the projects going on in the office and uh, how we spend time uh, on the side to develop methods and techniques that can be applied later on. And this is maybe my favorite. This is from the Kraft States, the uh, sort of a post-process uh, description of, of, of um, development of one of our projects, Parcel, which had kind of different loops and so on. So uh, the project idea was kind of formed during the process. Um, so just to point out that wha what, what we do is not only design, we actually have to deal with how uh, projects develop. Um, so we work with project development. We work on a strategic end to think about how we can um, prepare ourselves for, for the near future. Uh, we develop methods and tools that sometimes can be reused and sometimes are used only in one project. Um, and to, to exemplify quite quickly, um, uh, I think I've chosen three projects here uh, to talk about. This is the Park One, a new center for ambulance service and fire brigade here in Stockholm in the process. Uh, a collaboration with Adam Scar Taylor and White Architects, uh, and we've been really facilitating the development of these facades. Um, so there's a design team that literally uses the tools and techniques that we provide, and of course combines that with all other means of, of um, design investigation and representation. Uh, the second one is a project nearly completion. Uh, it's an extension to a hotel uh, situated just between Globen. Uh, and uh, Tele2 Arena, the arena south of, of St central Stockholm. And we really work with a banquet hall uh, inside this atrium of the building. Um, this has been a long time in the making, about three years, uh, and uh, has been on site for a while. Uh, what's interesting with this is that uh, it's an interior project, um, and it faces a lot of issues. It may look to seem like a quite simple geometry and so on. Uh, but we really had to design even the, the uh, fittings for the manufacturer to hold down material while producing it. Um, so um, there's much to say about this project, which I'll probably return to at another time, uh, in terms of, for instance, precision uh, and the tolerances. And uh, a lot of things happen on the construction side. The third project is also in the making. Um, the uh, redevelopment of a square in Uppsala, Forum Torget. Um, and here, uh, my team is in charge, more or less, over this 65 meter long uh, piece of furniture, uh, which is really one of the main features of, of, of the project. I should say that's Tam de Gord's uh, uh, project for the Uleans shopping mall next to it, and we work with the square. So in this case, uh, we developed a concept very early on in a competition that we won, and then we had to develop techniques and principles for how to deal with the continuous transformation uh, of this uh, piece of furniture, uh, sort of a back end of a parametric system and model, and numerous incarnations of, of representations to explore formal variants all along the way, coming also to the full scale. Um, and of course, what we're now preparing for is how to actually make sure that this can be produ produced, upholding the design principles but also lasting for 30 years, uh, which is something quite different from the experiments maybe I'm, I'm used to before. A, a lot of um, knowledge gained during the process uh, and also a bit of collaboration here with 
with when we set up the CNC a couple of few years ago, and we did one of our first prototypes here at school. Uh, but later on, it was done by a producer um, and set on site. So, apart from these engagements in projects, uh, what happens in a in a big firm with a quite varied design culture is, of course, you you need to try to communicate and reach out and sort of suggest to people, well, maybe you can work differently. So we do that in a number of different ways. We, we develop methods that we document. We have, of course, sort of networks. We give out a newsletter as well. Um, and we do a series of shop talks that quite intrigues me because those are situations which you literally talk about the craft of the trade uh, and you present and discuss how we actually make things. Um, so shifting uh, back to the map, uh, I will then try to quickly go into the education side of, of, of this puzzle. Um, mentioned before that um, we teach, uh, I teach here together with Oliver Testman. The fourth uh, cycle of a studio initially started by myself and Hanif Kara and others, um, in which we on one hand are interested in digital design principles and methodologies, but also finding venues or situations in which these can be applied uh, to be contextualized. The first year, we worked with industrial architecture, um, trying to reapply design thinking to them. And this year, we're approaching um, the area south of Stockholm, which is part of a vision for 2030. But we're really interested in, in temporal architecture and how that could actually facilitate the changes expected, among other places, the meatpacking district. Uh, this was just kicked off this week. Uh, one of the early studies is really to, do, to, to look at the quite advanced research pavilions conducted in different places of the or developed in different places of the past 10 years or so and see what can we learn from that. Uh, can we actually bring that to a situation in which we not only put it on a stand and show it, hey, it can stand up, but actually program them with different functions. Um, I should also say that we're quite interested here in, in the sort of craft of and hands-on um, build up of structures, understanding of materials, but also the understanding of practices. Uh, in our study trips, for instance, we often meet other practitioners and, and discuss methods with them. Um, I'll, I'll get back to this diagram, actually, a bit later. So it's, um, I'll return to that. So the third uh, field here, then, of course, is research. And I'll be quite brief here, actually. Um, and maybe more relate to how I've seen certain discourses that's been happening. This is certainly not a complete picture. Ulrike already mentioned Greg before, um, with really uh, one of the reasons that uh, so many things have happened for the past 20 years. Uh, we both have different associations to Greg. Uh, and here I, I just wanted to bring up this one of the more recent endeavors. He's taking on the archaeology of the digital, looking back at the early development of this field. On the other extreme, perhaps, you have the notion of parametricism and Patrick Schumacher's ever never-ending battle across the world to say that, well, there's this big stylistic movement, um, which I, by the way, do not adhere to. But um, um, uh, it makes for a, a quite interesting and critical discussion. Uh, Michael speak, uh, Speaks has been a, a quite um, important person for me, myself. He's also been uh, following and, and reviewing my research. Um, and he, at the time, maybe five, six, seven years ago, really looked at practice. And he's even suggested that today, companies start to operate as universities. And universities, universities may even start to work as companies. Well, we're quite familiar with uh, the number of publications we need to publish in research to be getting enough credits and so on. So you certainly get that feel. And then back to that diagram. This is Robert H. Um, about uh, 15 years or so, he started the development of um, uh, a piece of software called Generative Components, among other things. He's then been really a part of setting up or, or facilitating a, a global community of, of quite interested uh, and enthusiastic users and developers. And um, this, this idea of shop talks, meaning to, to exchange ideas on how you do things with new tools uh, has really flourished. Uh, and these communities are quite special. These diagrams, by the way, um, indicate the difference between 
using a, a modeling software directly uh, and then starting to use somehow a parametric system and then eventually starting to script. What he has uh, had, uh, or maybe he still has, was the ambition to create a tool in which someone could work very intuitively and someone else could uh, go deep into programming and you can find collaborative situations in that context. Um, within w w one of the aspects that I found quite interesting in, in my own sort of near history uh, kind of investigation uh, is something I've called digital design tropes. And this development has been driven by, I think, a sort of a strive for the new uh, link to maybe new tools, new principle, new techniques. And as soon as you've seen enough and something is saturated, you kind of drop it off and you start to look for something else. I think it's worth to go back a little bit and see what's actually been happening for the, ten, the past 10 years or so. Um, one thing is, of course, different ways of looking at patterns. This is a Voronoi pattern, one of the uh, usual suspects in this context. Uh, the other one may be to think about how we relate to spatial organization and um, going from a diagram to the spatial organization of a certain complexity uh, is, is something that has been facilitated by new techniques as well. Um, and of course, these kind of patterns are reoccurring in different ways, and this is just sort of the basic principles for the setup of a pattern that then at the moment is part of our development for Parquet, as mentioned previously. Um, and then my final note, and this I was almost not bringing this up, um, is back to the experiments. I feel personally that I haven't really experienced uh, ex experimented for, for quite some time, although as this line up there, uh, suggests I actually regard practice as, as a lab, in a way, to test ideas. Uh, I, I know my boss is here, so I'm, I should say that I do that under very controlled conditions. Uh, but uh, it is interesting to me to bring in new design thinking into practice, and I regard that as an experiment. But if I would look to the near future and what really you know, I, I think we need, especially perhaps after this weekend's election, is maybe vision uh, and uh, speculation. Um, I've, I've, I've tried to formulate that also in my thesis, uh, and I've been interested in science fiction and science fiction theory, if there is, is such a thing, and a number of concepts. Um, and extrapolations and cognitive estrangements are such uh, ideas. This is Kim Stanley Robinson's uh, trilogy on Mars, the exploration on Mars, and it's, it's well known to be very scientifically well-founded, yet in his, uh, these scenarios, he also uh, really goes deep into cultural issues and political issues. So technology is the basis, but then it goes into society. The other image is a, uh, a, a scenario from a student project, on my, a student of mine at the AA, which literally goes to 241,000 years in the future in somehow a speculation, which is maybe um, to the extreme. And final, on a final note, I just want to mention another project that we're actually starting up. Uh, and this is a collaboration between myself and Oliver Tessman as part of architecture technology here at the KTH. Uh, and this is another construction that should hopefully come up, up at KTH uh, as part of the new entrance. Um, this is, in a way, a commission from the KTH to researchers to, to manifest research in the KTH as part of this entrance. We want to use it as a vessel uh, and, a, and a situation to reach out to other uh, departments, especially in, in, in uh, terms of material research. Uh, so the idea is that this, this uh, canopy uh, and this uh, location here should be in place in about a year's time. Um, that kind of wraps up my presentation. I'm clueless about the time, but I, I sort of hurried up, and I think maybe that's good. Um, and um, this map is maybe something we can return to later on. That's all. Thank you. Are we ready to start again? Okay, so uh, thank you very much uh, for this presentation.
of the uh, uh, short lectures, main introductions to, uh, to your current work and both and your past work. Uh, it's uh, really interesting to have an opportunity to see uh, both of you uh, present together uh, as you have both collaborated over a long time and now run to different studios uh, here in the school. Um, I, I wanted to ask some sort of more open questions uh, for you and then also I'm, I'm sure there are questions from the audience uh, before we, we, we uh, wrap up. Uh, but I would be interested in starting with a, a quite open question on both of you mentioned uh, uh, the kind of long, or the history of the field, that there is now uh, a history of at least, uh, well, I guess about 25 years, almost. We start the early 90s maybe, so not, not really 25 years, to a kind of... Um, highly uh, sort of avant-garde, progressive, digital design practice in architecture, uh, which is not about the opportunities of the CAD drawing, but uh, uh, much more about uh, uh, design processes, form giving, precision, unprecision, geometry, and so forth. And I want to ask if, I mean, if both of you are, are involved in this kind of notoriously progressive field, but also having been in the field for quite some time now, uh, what are the challenges to, or how do you see it as a kind of the, the continuation of progressivity? Do you see that as a challenge? Uh, and if so, where are the challenges? Or are there points where the prog progressiveness is kind of peaking? If you see the question. Uh, it would be interesting to just hear you reflect a bit about the kind of notorious progression. Can you hear me? Uh, well, it's a good thing we wrote an article this spring together because we've been talking for a bit, so it is yeah, time for one meeting. So maybe I'll return to that. I also have to say, I mean, especially with Pablo Miranda in the crowd, that the history goes back way, way longer, if that makes sense. But maybe it's different also. Um, I mean, Pablo last this afternoon mentioned Christopher Alexander and uh, many others. But I think this is maybe a different kind of culture, so I think it's, it did start there. Um, I think one issue that we, we discussed a little bit then was that now, let's say tools, techniques, and maybe these tropes that I presented are readily available, so you can see that they are now coming out into practice and everyone uses it. So maybe the, then it's more interesting to actually go back into how do you still experiment? How can you sort of reset the tools, uh, still sort of work um, at a much higher level um, to refine, um, well, the techniques and principles, but how, how you think about architecture, how you design it, how you produce it. But I also want to add that um, the one of the challenges I find, of course, with, with my foot in practice is that um, how, how do you actually create innovation in inside project processes uh, that has to face other issues? And I think also what practice brings me is, is sort of an agency beyond the discourses that we explore. I mean, I'm also very interested in the, let's say, an aesthetic discourse or formal principles of investigations. Um, but I, I'm quite keen on, on seeing what the stuff I've been developing for the past 15 years, how that can change practice and how in extension it also transforms society in different ways. So that's kind of an agency that I'm personally looking for. Um, uh, of course, this was a very complex question, Katja, uh, <laughs> that you asked. Uh, and um, I think what's, I think personally what's extremely interesting now is actually to uh, partially what I uh, brought up to uh, what happens like to look look even more at uh, traditional techniques of manufacturing or analog processes and how these analog processes interface with uh, digital techniques for design and fabrication and how can you learn or how can you mess with that also engaging that is on a kind of a concrete on a, on a um, uh, almost like a craft level how w which I also think uh, it's interesting from, um, a, I mean, con con continually interesting from a political level that you're engaged in 
understanding the manufacturing processes, uh, what are the materials, etc. You are closer to, the, to those as a designer or architect. Uh, but also what is interesting, I think, today to uh, uh, work partially disciplinary. L like, what is it um, to work with history or to work with uh, the, the precedence of our discipline? to um, inform a design process. And it has to do a little bit with looking at like how, how traditional techniques of design and manufacturing meets contemporary modes of design and manufacturing, but also how uh, conception of space and design, historically, space and architecture, historically. And I think that's happening, starting to happen all over uh, the world, and I uh, also within not only uh, artistic-based professors and and uh, and associate professors, etc., but also those that are perhaps engaged in history theory start to engage in matter and uh, start to engage in uh, uh, fictions of design. No, uh, I mean the second second question, but also and of course, I mean it's interesting. Whenever we try to paint a history, we like we try to find a starting point. And now I was thinking Colombia, 1990s or something like that. So that's one starting point. And there are much, much, uh, many other layers of starting points. But uh, the next question I wanted to ask about the connection between. Um, if we say that you are, and I mean, I, th I think one can probably argue with this, but if we say that you're both working in a, in a field and then with an interest that's highly technolo technologically charged uh, in some way uh, or another, I see in uh, the work you show, Ulrika, that you're really sort of also mixing as a kind of counter technology and technology in some way. Uh, but what would you say um, that, you know, these technological advances and the new possibilities uh, that the new software, new, new robot technologies and so forth are, are bringing with it. What would you say, how, how does that connect and how does that uh, respond to uh, like large societal cha challenges today? You even mentioned you know, the elections that is on everybody's mind today, but even in relation to that, like how, how do you see or how do you talk about and discuss politi the political issues relating to your practice? Uh, another uh, complex question, perhaps. But that's, that's a very complex question. I think one thing that's been striking me for the past years is maybe more cultural than political, but th there's this whole idea of maker culture um, that sort of grows through all creative discipline somehow and could perhaps be seen as a democratic movement of you know uh, giving you agency to well design your own things on one hand um, I think it addresses sustainability um, it's not your nose not so much maybe a consumer anymore um, th this movement is very much using the similar technologies that we've been exploring as architects with producers and so on and I would say that architecture is still kind of beyond the, the reach for, for what we maybe used to call consumers in this uh, respect. But I think that's, uh, um, that's to me is very interesting. For instance, uh, a return of small scale industries to the inner cities uh, that provide jobs and that also changes uh, how we experience the city, uh, which is kind of a counter movement, I guess, to early modernist ideas, in a way. That was the easy way out. Architecture is political. <laughs> uh, but on a kind of concrete level of experience, uh, I've, been very I've been teaching here since uh, around about I started Servo, since end uh, end of 90s. And uh, in the beginning, I have many very uh, dear colleagues that are men, but what is interesting right now, there are all these women that are engaged in technology, intense uh, design. And I think that 
just that movement that thing that that is happening it's actually something that I'm experiencing like very very concretely uh, I think that is interesting uh, and uh, I pointed out earlier the the, the relationship to material processes. It's what's also very concretely interesting is to be both a Konstfak and here, where Konstfak has the tradition of arts, craft, and design. So all this craft, uh, craft educations. And I think that there's uh, an interesting relationship between uh, geometry and architecture, which has had kind of a, a high status in the arts, uh, and its relationship to craft. Um, I had a third thing, but uh, it might come later. Counting my sort of last uh, questions before uh, allowing uh, uh, other questions coming in as well. But uh, yeah, this might be an easy one. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I would be. It would be really interesting to hear both of you as uh, the, uh, relatively uh, new uh, professors here in the school. Uh, that are sure to influence where the school is uh, heading uh, in the future years. It would be interesting to hear um, we're moving to new facilities. We are bringing uh, our digital fabrication lab with us. Um, and we hope everything will work when they're moved in machinery. Uh, uh, but where do you see that we are heading as a school in terms of your field, uh, the near and the and the perhaps a bit further future, like are we are we coming along, and how are we? You know, what are we? What what is the most important thing that we are hopefully succeeding in? If the school supports our field, of course we will <laughs> be moving. <laughs> uh, where we will be moving? That was a very good question, uh, because we do uh, experience right now that the, on a also concrete level, that uh, to progress the education, you need to engage both in very material processes, fabrication, as well as your own design tool that uh, you can ha have in your hand in principle. But it both needs and demands small space and large space. You need to be able to mess around somewhere. and. Uh, and uh, we need to develop the digital fabrication lab, for example. And I know that we might not fit everything <laughs> in the new building. So we will have to rethink how do we develop, how, do, how, how, how will we be able to continue to be messy uh, uh, with heavy machines, <laughs> for example. Uh, is that in collaboration with other departments at KDH? Is it collaboration with industry? Is it making? A, is it collaboration with Konstfak? Is it making a new building? Is it uh, ha the big questions? Uh, one can perhaps do a little bit of everything. Yeah. yeah I think the collaboration is an, uh, an issue. I I had this all. It was literally actually a dream of, of uh, probably 10, 15 years ago of, of uh, working in an architectural practice which was also a workshop. Uh, and that, that dream has somehow also been continuously updated. I mean, now, for instance, there are some initiatives to set up a full scale lab for practices as well here in Stockholm. Um, I'm not sure where that is heading. And we've talked previously on that. I mean, Ulrike is at Konspak. I have relations with Beckmans as well, I've collaborated with teachers there. I think there's a great interest in, in joining forces to a certain extent. The tricky thing is that what's great with having this lab that we have now is that it's here. So we just go down there. We might have tutorials in the workshop or by the lazy cutter or by the CNC mill. So that's, I think, is one of the challenges. We need to pull up and that would be also interesting to, to cross over disciplines and discuss how we can collaborate. Um, but we need the space to be messy, and we need to be close to that space. So I think that is uh, an important challenge. What is interesting that is actually a discussion we are having at Bartlett is uh, uh, not only talking about a digital fabrication lab, but talking about an environmental lab, uh, where you can deal with uh, moist, heat, etc., uh, dirt, earth. Uh, so the the, the it's almost like the technology is uh, interfacing with uh, 
many other processes. And, and the funny thing here, and the interesting thing, is that the more digital we go, the more fiscal we get. So I think, I usually say when I do the first introductions to the fabrication lab that we haven't done this much fiscal modeling ever that we do right now. And if you go around for the diploma days here as well, that's what you can see. So maybe that's kind of a, a weird thing. I mean, uh, why do we not simulate only? Why do we go physical? I think it relates to our, our discipline, what we're doing. Um, we need that physical connection and we need to retake it. It relates to craft and to understand uh, material performance. And I'd say um, we need to continue to do that for a long, long time. One other thing that we brought up in the article that you wrote was actually also architecture's ability to abstract and, uh, and to work with representation. Like to, to somehow to let's talk about the other side of material, but actually representation and to the ability to abstract. And I think that is also something that is being, uh, that is also s right now being uh, researched. How do we work with drawing? How do we work with representation today? When there is a kind of a, um, like a um, uh, fabrication and representation are imploding. Like last year we had a student who draw with a nail machine. So, so th there is a, and also ha there were I think that mm, internationally also, I know many projects that are very, very interested in the notion of drawing and representation. And how do we think of that in relation to the digital technology that we have today? How have the digital technologies inform how we think about representation and drawing? Or how can we develop a new way of, of, of thinking about that? Also are very, very artistic, critical. Thank you. That's, uh, I think uh, one thing that's interesting with the move to the new school, that we have been kind of concerned about the space and do we fit in. And that, but, you know, there are more square meters there than there are here. So we'll see how we use it. So <laughs> hopefully we can get messy there as well. And there's a large terrace as well. So we can see what we can do. Um, okay. Uh, I'll open up for uh, more questions. No, <laughs> um, I just uh, wanted to connect a little bit with the things that you were commenting or talking about now about the drawing and school and the messiness, <laughs> but uh, at another level, it's because I mean we are all sort of been working in somehow this idea of how the digital or the computer changes or uh, architecture, how it affects it, and and I would like to hear what what kind of I mean, m my um, impression or is that um, architects until possibly the end of the 90s, we were all disciplined into drawing and that was education was about and what that's what school was about and many years of, of development of, of uh, curriculum that, that it was based on learning us how or te how teaching us how to how to draw and uh, I was and knowing, having this very specific knowledge that it was, you know, the thing that basically articulated the architecture discipline. And I was wondering what do you think about um, what are the effects of, um, of the digital and computation and so on in, in that, in the education and the knowledge we have as architects? I don't know if you could comment a little bit of that. I think it's very, very interesting territory. Uh, do you want to answer this first? Or no? well, I could reflect if I don't drop it now. But I think, on one hand, I think that we are still finding our ways with sort of a disciplinary, specific, let's say, understanding of computation. Uh, one example is that. We, we were very familiar and can identify a rigorous work, uh, really well worked through work, through drawings. Uh, it's like we, we have an intuitive understanding, also as teachers, and we can see the progress in a, in a student project, let's say, over time. Uh, and I think that's, 
to me that that's really comes from within the the discipline and how we've been training maybe i mean both of us are we were trained in drawing as well um last century um so so to a certain extent i think we n we need to link back to and, and you mentioned before that there's a renewed interest in hi in sort of history of of our tools let's say or our techniques but i also think we find need to find a way to to form a, um, our own disciplinary understanding of how these new new techniques works and how we for instance how do we share them how do we collaborate how do we evaluate things in the making uh do we look at code i mean that's that takes another kind of discipline almost uh so i think there's a lot of more work to be done basically I think it's very, very interesting, the drawing. And I know that during a certain time, perhaps in the 90s even, in the 90s, early 20s, perhaps there was um, a little bit of a uh, uh, non, uh, the precision in drawing was lacking a little bit. Like the knowledge of drawing was lacking uh, when we moved to digital technologies. But right now, there is almost like a reappropriation of drawing and even higher precision than before. Or, but I'm not saying that that's go, I'm not generalizing about this, but I think there is an interest in it. But I also know other ones that are highly advanced algorithmic designers that also question drawing. But I think it's very, very interesting. And I think it's a, it's a matter of, uh, it's a disciplinary tool that we have had for so, that is kind of the part of the canon of, of architecture that could of course be messed around with and 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 and, uh, and uh, um, critiqued but I think uh, it's uh, it's a right now is a very interesting moment to develop the notion of drawing in architecture w one, one strange thing I think is that to someone external to the discipline it would seem obvious that well, now we do 3D models. It's so much better. Uh, you can see what you get immediately. But from inside the discipline, sometimes that's that's tricky because we're used to seeing things. We need abstraction somehow, the section. We need that. That's not only a drawing for production. That's somehow a way that we're used to evaluate space. And I think that that is kind of an interesting aspect. or reflections I have a question to Ulrika. You pre presented the, the material and the digital as a kind of dichotomy. And uh, on the other hand, you say we want to learn from the craft. And I was wondering a little bit about your long-term agenda in your professorship now. There's a lot of research going on in the field of the digital tools towards implementing more and more the characteristics of material behavior. So one could say what you describe as the messiness becomes something which is formalized and can be described with the digital. Um, is that something you are after? Or would you say, well, I would like to have the separation and I'm looking for maybe the lucky accident or the, the exploration uh, of, 
finding something in the messiness that I did not expect to find. I think this, those are different approaches, and I was wondering uh, your position on that. Uh, no, I think uh, both are interesting. Uh, uh, at Bartlett right now, the we are working with uh, large scale simulations, like large urban, almost regional simulations of extreme uh, uh, complex uh, processes of, of uh, water and uh, granular matter. Parallel, the students are doing material experiments with sand and clay and, and things like that. So they are actually learning both through the material physical experiments and through setting up the digital simulations. And I think it's very, very interesting, but this is a, like a research that we just started and it's, we've done it for a year, like I've been engaged in it anyway. And it's, uh, it's, it's um, the relationship between the physical experiments and the digital simulations. We're keeping, yes, the, uh, uh, they are related uh, in terms of uh, data, in terms of um, information about uh, <laughs> grain size, uh, weight, uh, blah, blah, velocity of water conditions on site, water conditions, etc. So there are a series of uh, extremely precise parameters that the students are working with, but yet there is a loose relationship between the physical experiments and the did large digital simulations. And I think it's actually extremely interesting. And, and that, is, um, that is approaching like sim simulating material processes. But I do still see, like, uh, there is a, they are not the same. There are, you learn different things from the physical experiments and from the digital simulation of material uh, behavior. And that will probably, I mean, this is a kind of a, a new field also that is advancing right now in terms of resolution and the ability to work with extreme amount of data at the same time. But, and how we actually handle that. Um, yeah, um, so I think that is valid. I don't, th I don't see it as a dichotomy. I see it more as a tandem. Or like, uh, I think that it, it's, it's, it's valuable to, I mean, we don't have a lot of advanced digital simulation as a, uh, skills, uh, all of us here. There are more people with a very advanced digital simulation skills, for example, where I'm teaching at Bartlett, but that doesn't mean that one way of working or the other way is better. Or it's li it's different uh, pedagogical and methodological techniques that are both. I think both are valid and interesting. Both and. So if, if we have had this revolution for almost 25 years, I'm, I, I'm kind of a little bit disappointed. <laughs> I mean, I, I have a suspicion from your work that there is the curtain is going to be drawn back and we will see more implications of this work. Because right now, your tropes are very incriminating. Your view of the, the kind of the fallout of this revolution is very very possible that I don't know what's going on, but mm. you you are inside the, the work. When I look from the outside, I think nothing has changed. Nothing really has changed. So I would love you to to confront that or uh, contest that. First thing is, I, I don't really believe in revolutions in, in that sense. I don't think this is a revolution at all. I think both of us, maybe in different ways, we. And, and personally, for instance, when I started to take on digital techniques, the first thing I did was to start to reevaluate the techniques I've learned before. I understood that our classical uh, notions of representations are constructs and techniques and tools, in a way. 
that the plan is an obstruction, the section is an obstruction. So I really regard, uh, I started to, to um, both appreciate and, and be able to stand uh, somehow, maybe, maybe reflect more on those. I became more aware of how that has influenced architectural history and the development architecture, the, the, the ways we conceive, mm -hmm. the, the, the mechanisms we use for that. Um, so to me, I think, I mean, it's hard, hard, hard to, to, to uh, answer the nothing has changed because certainly everything changes all the time in a way. Uh, but I assume you're looking for some profound change. Um, and I think I'm personally very interested in, in this, um, um, these new, or these communities that disseminate uh, knowledge between passionate users of these techniques, so to speak, I think that's new. I think it's different. It doesn't go through academia or through a particular discourse. There's sort of an emergent tendency to what I refer to as shop talk among these people. Uh, some of that has maybe no application. Uh, we have maybe yet to see where that leads, but I think that's is probably for me the most profound change, uh, which allows someone who hasn't even graduated to present a paper at the conference together with a 65-year-old professor. I think that's different. Uh, so I think that's um, something that's really been thought-provoking to me. history and craft and things like that. So, so of course I'm engaged, I'm very interested in the discipline of architecture. I'm interested in architecture so I think uh, that has to be continued to be discussed I, uh, in relation to contemporary times of uh, design and fabrication, how things are made and not made. Uh, but then I think it also is a difference in terms of, like I see my son, yeah, he's already over and done with Minecraft and he's in you know he's it's very social like the how we socialize through these techniques both in design and uh, through everyday use uh, I think that is of course changing how we both socialize and are proactive with uh, design thinking yeah that that also I mean so I think uh, uh, and how it changes the field of architecture it has changed how we organize our work. It has changed how we um, uh, how we um, communicate our work and the processes. And uh, so uh, that's just somehow like a kind of facts. Uh, but then I think it's fun also, and I think it, uh, there is an obligation to uh, be critical about the tools at your hand, whether it's a magnifying glass, a ruler, or a software. So that's the kind of a duty that we have as an academic institution to engage in a, a with the tools and a kind of a critical use of the tools to be able to affect the use and the development of the tools at hand. Uh, just following up on this, that I think, uh, I mean, maybe it's already done, or uh, it'd be interesting to know if, if it is being done. But I mean, I, I think somehow there is an interesting relation if we think about um, the kind of the history of form and uh, of the kind of formal uh, the forms that are uh, sort of resulting from from this. Uh, if we look at, uh, I mean, we were speaking about the other day about Kiesler and uh, and also, of course, we can see a lot of uh, 1950s experimentation in concrete uh, double shells um, form and, and so forth, where there's kind of formal resemblances and reiterations uh, throughout history, but that actually has very, sometimes very little to do with each other in terms of uh, technology. Um, 
is there already uh, such a kind of history of of architecture written uh, in relation to that and how to discuss these but perhaps superficial resemblances or what do they mean so to say um, i ended my talk about like asking the questions where where uh, where whereas this uh, experimentation and interest in perhaps a kind of obscure and the legibility of form, whatever, if that is a technological or cultural phenomena. And I think actually it is a cultural phenomena. So and, and it uh, relates to time. It relates to where, when we, what, uh, the kind of circumstances we are living in. The technology is only tools, are only tools for engaging with the kind of the cultural context we are engaging in. I think when, I mean, you also mentioned that um, I mean, people like Mario Carpo, for instance, who is an Alberti scholar and, and many others, look at this field now and, well, m maybe um, allows it to, to influence their own theory making in a way. Um, what's, what's kind of striking is that there's uh, quite a big difference on how you discuss techniques if, you're, if you've been part of that development or if not, uh, which means that you can probably be more critical if you were never in that process. And I think that's that's uh, something really extremely interesting to me. And there are a number of Swedish scho scholars also that, that look uh, towards this, um, not even from, from an architectural standpoint, but from other standpoints. So that's, um, that's something I welcome uh, quite a bit, uh, because obviously you can maybe become, I mean, I think the early years of de development here uh, and so on, if, if one would start from the 90s and onwards, was really, on one hand, um, I wouldn't call it opportunistic, but really an open-ended search for something. Uh, you weren't really sure what you were looking for, and so we were quite enthusiastic and sort of just looking for something uh, like um, the solution to a problem we don't even know, and so on. Um, I think that was important, and, and I think uh, architecture needs that also, but it certainly needs uh, reflection as well. Um, so I think that, that that history is in the making in many different from many different perspectives, um, and um, yeah, alternate views, so to speak. We are yes, uh, are about to finish. So. Um Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonas and Ulrika. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for listening and asking uh, questions. I think it's, uh, we should have continued debates about this. And we will, of course, uh, in the, uh, in the com coming crits and exhibitions around the work and so forth. Um, so thank you very much. And I don't know, uh, Bjorn, if you want to announce next week, we have...